Well, good morning. Um, it's good to be back with you <coughs> in Kilkeel this morning. Um, it's a lovely day after yesterday. And it's great for myself and Beverly, my wife, to be here today. She'll need to be in my best behavior today. Uh, I want to thank the two ladies for playing the piano this morning, by the way. It's beautiful music this morning. It was really well played and it, uh, it really exalts the Lord. Let's just come before him, the Lord, this morning as we look at his word. <coughs> Our God and Father, we thank you this morning that Jesus loves even me. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts, O God, for the love of God and sending the Son to the cross for one who was willing to come and lay down his life as a ransom for us. We thank you for every blessing that we have today in the person of Christ. We thank you for a long life's journey, how our blessings are indeed, as David reminds us, more in number than the sand. And we acknowledge thy goodness and thy kindness to us again this Lord's Day morning. We thank you for the Lord's Day morning. We thank you for the Lord's people. We thank you for the Lord's table today. We pray that our hearts will appreciate more the person of Christ today as we sit at the table. And just now, O oh God, we pray to bless us as we turn to your word. We thank you that your word is a lamp, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray as we open it this morning, we thank thee for it today. We thank thee that the word of God, the word that we have in our hands is the inspired word of God. We pray for many that don't have this privilege today. We pray for the persecuted church. And we thank you for the freedom and liberty that we have in this province of Ulster. And so we, we pray this morning as we turn to it and glean from it that our hearts were born within us as you walk with us through it today. We pray for our brother George at the Lee today. We pray to bless him and many others who spread the gospel today and minister a word. We pray a blessing upon them and ourselves now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles this morning, please, to the second book of Samuel and chapter 23. The second book of Samuel and chapter 23. We do intend this morning to have a very simple, because that's a type of guy that I am. I want to be very simple today and I want to just go down through these verses very simply today and just look at a few things from them. And we're in the second book of Samuel and chapter 23 and please keep your Bibles handy and open this morning. Second Samuel 23. Now these be the last words of of David. The last words of David. You see, last words are very important words. How many books have been written on people's last words? People who are standing right at the brink of eternity. And in just a moment or two, they slip over the river, and into eternity. Last words. I, I read lately of D.L. Moody, that great American preacher, evangelist. As he lay <clears throat> on his bed, his daughter sat beside him. There was a nurse in the room. The, the nurse wrote after the moments that passed in her journal, that she had never been with someone who was so content as they slipped into eternity. And as D.L. Moody <coughs> lay on his deathbed, he said this just a moment or two before he died. He said, Earth is receding, 
and heaven is calling. His daughter Emma sat by her sat by his side and she grabbed his hand and she says, Oh Lord, don't let my daddy die. D.L. Moody says in his weakness, Emma, don't pray a prayer like that. He says, this is my finest hour. And in just a moment or two, he went into eternity. Last words. I read lately as well, <clears throat> uh, there was a French philo- philosopher. His name was Voltaire. He was an infidel and uh, atheist. And as he lay on his deathbed, he screamed in terror and fear. And his last words were, I am abandoned by God and by men also, and they shall die and go to hell. It would make your flesh creep, wouldn't it? To think that a man could slip into eternity like that. I thought just the other night about my own grandmother. She wasn't well. My grandfather had Alzheimer's disease for the last 12 years of his life, and he passed on. And in just a few years, my grandmother took leukemia. And then that cancer spread through her. She was 89 years of age. <clears throat> and uh, on the Sunday night, Beverly and I went to the hospital to see her, to Galvin Hospital. And uh, she was very, very weak. And I remember her just like it was yesterday. It's five or six years ago now. I remember going into the ward. It was late at night, maybe half ten, eleven o'clock. We knew she wouldn't be here much longer. And a few of the family were around the bed and we sat a moment or two a wee while. And then I <clears throat> went to her and grabbed her hand and I said to her, Nana, we called her Nana, I says, Nanny, we're going to go. I'll call tomorrow. It was a Sunday night. And uh, I kissed her on the forehead. And uh, she was very weak. But she said to me, in the weakness of her voice, she says, I love you. <clears throat> and I said back to her, I love you too. She died on Monday morning. Later on that night, a few of the family were with her after we went home. And uh, one of my dad's brothers, Philip, who's a pastor in Emmanuel Church in Lurgan, he was sitting with her. On his own, he was holding her hand. He, he said to her, Mum, you realize what's happening to you? And she gave a very slight nod. He, he said to her, are you afraid? And she said, no fear. And as far as I know, that was her last words. Last words. And, and, and where we've read this morning, these are the last words of David, the inspired writer tells us. And so they're worth looking at this morning. They're worth taking a, a glance at today. And you'll notice that the inspired writer then, he, he, he lists four attributes of David's. Very interesting. David, he says, the son of Jesse. That's number one. Number two, the man who was raised up on high. Number three, the anointed of the God of Jacob. Number four, the sweet psalmist of Israel. I wonder if you or I had been writing this first, what particular order we would have put these in. Isn't it interesting that the inspired writer, the first thing after, you know, perhaps if it had been us, we'd have said, these are the last words of David, the great king of Israel. And that would have been good. But isn't it amazing that the inspired writer, the first attribute that he attributes to David here is that he was the son of Jesse. Mind you, you know, this must have been something that David was very proud of. He was the son of Jesse. 
People say to me all the time, you know, when they see me or the, uh, I'm introduced to someone for the first time, they usually say to me, are you uh, that fella, Nori Emerson's son? The boy that does the preaching and the boy that preaches at Northfield and all, that sort of thing. You know, I like that. <laughs> and, and David, he must have been proud to be called the son of Jesse. You know, Jesse, I believe as we study the scriptures that Jesse, it was just a very poor, humble farmer's home in Bethlehem where he was from. Bethlehem was known for its poverty. Of course, we all know that the Lord Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem and, and he was born into that humble place, into the, at, at the back of that inn, that Christmas morning, that first Christmas morning. But, I mean, David, he, he was born in Bethlehem. And, and he came from Jesse's household. And, and there wasn't much, I believe, in Jesse's household, but, but David was proud of it. And I, I would be sure that when David was exalted to the throne of Israel, that his household was well looked after. I have no doubt about that. That's the type of man that he was. And, and, and we're not told much about Jesse in the Scripture. But I'm sure if he had lived on, and, and if he would have had the great privilege of seeing his son, on, on the throne of Jerusalem, well, then Jesse would have been looked after well. And so, well, the first thing he tells us is that he's the son of Jesse. It, it tells us something about a family, doesn't it? You know, our families are of the utmost importance. You know, many things are important in life. But, you know, you know a person, I believe, by the way they treat their family by the sort of relationship that there is in the family and in the family unit. I know men who are, have done well in business and, and have more money than, than they'll ever need and the generations after them, and, and yet they're real family men. And that's a good attribute to have. And, and so David, he's called, first of all, the son of Jesse. You know, I am sure that David would have kept that commandment well, honor thy father and thy mother, the son of Jesse. The second thing then, he was the man <clears throat> who was raised up on high. The man who was raised up on high. You see, God took him from the shepherd's field, from the sheep field, and he put him on the throne of Israel. You know, it does my heart good when I think that. You know, we need men and women in the kingdom of God and working for his kingdom. We need people that are educated and, and we need astuteness and all these different things. Don't get me wrong, but isn't it great to know that God can take men from the sheep feed, take men from the farm, take men from the building site, take men and women from the office, take men and women just from the, the ordinary road of life and use them for his kingdom. We're all the same after all in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter what we have. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter where we've been when God looks upon us. And God had looked upon David. And God had, had put David, God had brought David into that home in Bethlehem, that poor home, that small farm. And God had put, placed him there and God had put his eye on him. And, and over the years, God had trained him in those fields. Doesn't the little chorus say, one day a roaring lion came and then a growling bear, and he asked the Lord to strengthen him. And he slew him then and there. And all those different circumstances of David's life, one by one, were just real training grounds for Jerusalem and for the throne. He was the son of Jesse. He was a man. He was raised up on high. Point three, he was anointed of the God of Israel. You remember? Remember when God told Samuel to go to the, the house in Bethlehem? And, and you remember how Samuel came into that home that day and, and, and those big fellas all passed before him. Seven of them, six or seven of them, do you remember? And, and every one that passed before him, oh, they were, they were tall, they're, they were well built, they had big broad shoulders and all the different things, but they weren't God's men. And, and they all passed before Samuel, and, and Samuel says no. And then he says to Jesse, have you any other sons? 
And uh, Jesse said, you can see Jesse sitting in the chair there at the table, and Jesse says, there's just David. We David. And he's just out on the hillside. He's just mounting a few sheep. Samuel says, send some of them other boys for him. And you remember how David came from the field? And the minute he walked out in through the door there, the minute Samuel seen him, he knew he was God's man. The Bible says that he was, he was ruddy and he was good looking. Tan skin, I believe. He had walked in on the eastern sun as he had, a, as he had a walked around the fields after the sheep. He was tanned and, and, and he was good looking. That's what the Bible says. And the moment he walked through the door, Samuel knew he's God's man. He was anointed there in the house in Bethlehem before his brothers. And then, he, of course, he was anointed by the Spirit of God through his life as he ruled over the great people of Israel. So he was the son of Jesse. He was the man whom God had raised on high. He was anointed of the God of Jacob. Number four, he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. There's 150 psalms in the Bible. 75 of those psalms, 50% of them, have David's name upon them, the psalm of, a psalm of David. There's many other psalms that, that have no author, and perhaps David wrote them. And I'm sure there's many that have never even made their way onto the pages of Scripture, but he's a sweet psalmist of Israel. Many of the hymns that we even sing in our churches today and in our services are psalms that that David penned. That great psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How many times different hymn writers have taken it and have broke it up perhaps and put things in between. But you know what I'm saying? The, the great psalms are still there. You know, the hymn or the songs of this world, they make their way into the church, don't they? And the ax factor and things like this. And then in a week or two, they're gone. Some of the psalms that David penned are now thousands of years old. And they're as popular now as ever the war. The man who was raised up on high, the son of Jesse, the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Israel, <coughs> the sweet psalmist of Israel. The anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, I haven't even started. <laughs> Look down, please, to verse 8. We're going to have to jump a wee bit. And we're coming to verse 8. And so what happens then, I imagine David here, he's, he's, he's speaking his last words, and David's memory begins to work, and he begins to think of the great battles and the great circumstances that God has brought in his life. And onto the pages of Scripture, 37 men's names come. Now, you'll be really glad to know that I'm not going to read the 37 names because they didn't go to Queens or anything like that. But I just want this morning to look at the first three of these men. And we're looking at verse 8. <clears throat> verse 8, 2 Samuel 23. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. Here's the first one. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up a spear against 800 men whom he slew at one time. The Tachmanite, Adino the Esnite. I want to think of these first three men this morning. And the first thing I want you to think about this particular man, Adino, was that the Lord had his head. And that's tactical. He, he was a tactical sort of a man because he lifted up his sword against 800 men at one time. And so this man must have had a great battle brain on him. He must have been a great war strategist. How could he stand against 800 men at one time with a sword in his hand? Now, the first thing it tells us is that he sat in the seat and so that tells us that in the city that he was from, that he must have been like an elder in the city, or something down to our, our modern day, he must have been on the council in the city. 
In those days, at the city, outside the city walls, the fortified cities, there were seats at the gate. And uh, there was chosen men in the city who sat in those seats. Do you remember Lot and Sodom? He sat outside the gate of the city. And so, a dino here was the same. He was a Tachmanite. He was a dino, the Esnate, and he sat in the seat. And so he was in a place of authority in the town, in the city, where he was from. But he was one greater than that was, he, was that he was one of, of David's mighty men. You see, he was a man who was not intimidated by numbers. And that's important. You see, because one man and God is always the majority. Remember that. Do you remember when Elijah went out onto Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal? Do you remember that he stood alone against 450 men, that great prophet of old? I was reading about it the other night about how, do you remember when Elijah came out, he, he went and, and how those 450 prophets of Baal, how they come to the mountainside and how they built the altar. And it was at the morning sacrifice at nine o'clock in the morning. And they built the stones. And then you remember how that great contest took place. And Elijah says to him, he says, let's build an altar. And Elijah says, let's just sort this out once and for all now. He says, you prophets of Baal build an altar. And he says, then call down the fire from heaven. And he says, I'll do the same and we'll see who, when the fire comes, who really is God. And those 450 men, they built the altar and then they began to walk around the sacrifice and call upon Baal. And so it went on, and you remember how the, then they began to dance around the altar. And then they began to actually, the Bible tells us, the Scripture tells us that they began to cut themselves, and the blood gushed out of them. That's what it's saying. And then I think Elijah begins to sort of make a wee bit of fun of them. He says, listen, maybe Baal's sleeping. Maybe he's had a long day. He says, shoot a wee bit louder. Uh, and maybe he's away on a journey. You know, call a wee bit louder in Abbey. And, and so this took place for six hours until the hour of the evening sacrifice and nothing happened. And then, do you remember how Elijah, not intimidated by numbers either, like they know how he set the altar up. You could imagine them at it, couldn't you? Just taking it stone by stone, slowly and building it right for the Lord. And then that great content of water that great quantity of water was poured around the sacrifice. And then how he stood back and how he prayed and, and how the fire came from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. It consumed the sacrifice. It actually burnt, burnt the altar. You know, it's, it's important to read the Scriptures carefully. It says that it, it actually this particular fire, it licked up the dust. Such was the intense heat of the flame that come from heaven. And then another thing it says, it says that it burnt the stones. Now, I don't know too much, but I know a wee bit about stone and gravel and stuff. And you can't burn stones. Well, we can't burn stone anyway. When a building's burned, usually what's left is the, the concrete work, isn't it? The blocks and, or the stone work's left. It, it may have got black with the fire, but that's what's left. But in this particular instance, the very dust, the very stones were burned. Such was the fire from heaven from God. You see, one man and God is always the majority. And here's a dino, and he's standing fearless. He's standing against 800 men, and he slays them at one time. A dino means slender. As night means strong. So you can see the sort of an individual he was. He was strong. He was slender. He was fit. He was strong. He was of himself. He could handle things. But then God was with him. Some of the actual, it's interesting that some of the commentators actually think that this guy, for some reason, that they know, was small, small in stature. I read that. Don't know where they get it from. It's something to do with the race of people. Well, if that was the case, if he was small, well then, you know this old saying about it doesn't matter the size of the dog and the fight, it's the size of the fight and the dog, you know, that kicks in. You can see him standing with a, with a sword in his hand, and he slays 800 men at one time. A dino, <clears throat> so the Lord had his heart, that was tactical. 
Look at verse 9. <clears throat> the next one, as time goes on very quickly. After him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo the Ahoite. These are great names, aren't they? One of the three mighty men with David. When they defeated the Philistines, that were gathered together to go to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he rose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. That's interesting, isn't it? It was the Lord who wrought the great victory that day. And the people returned after him, only to spoil. Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Yehoite. If the Lord had Adino's head, well then, with Eliezer, the Lord had his hand. Adino was a tactical man. Eliezer was a practical man. You know, I love practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. Raymond out our church wasn't so well. Another brother out our church, Billy, called to see him. It was the early spring. They were sitting in the kitchen. They were having a cup of tea. The sun was shining. It was a nice morning. Raymond says, you know, when I get better again, <clears throat> up and about again, Billy, he says, the first job I'm going to do is paint that fan. And Raymond woke up the next morning and he thought he heard something. And he looked out the window and Billy was painting the fence. That's practical Christianity, isn't it? My wife and I, when our kids were smaller, I had to go one Sunday morning to speak at a church service in Brushian. And uh, the lady, uh, the, the, the lady who had asked us to come, um, had rung and she says, Ken, would you like to come for your lunch? And I said, listen, thank you very much. I think it might have been Beverly that was talking to her. She said, thank you very much. Listen, our kids are small. We need to get back to Sunday school. In fact, she says, we'll not have much time, actually, by the time we leave and get home, the Sunday school's at 3 o'clock and so on. And so when we went to brush Shane that morning, <clears throat> she had, uh, we there a moment or two, and uh, before the church service, and she brought us in, and she gave us tea and she had juice for the kids. And so I took the service, and when we were coming out, she says, listen, don't go away until I see you. And so when we uh, shook hands at the door and so on, when we went out, this lady says, come with me. And so she went, and she opened the boot of her car. And when she opened the boot of her car, she lifted this picnic basket out. And she says, you were saying that you haven't much time before Sunday school, so we're thinking it's a nice day. And maybe you just pull in for a moment or two down the road somewhere, and there's a, a wee picnic for you. One of the nicest things anybody ever done. I thought it was very practical Christianity. And, and Adino, <clears throat> or Eliezer, was a practical man. He never let go of a sword. You can see him, can't you? He has a sword in his hand. These Philistines are coming towards him, and, and he gets stuck in, you see. And he slices, and he cuts, and gets on. And he, and he fights that hard, and, 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 the, and the battle is prolonged so long that, that he never let go of the sword. And when the battle was finished, his hand was cramped around the sword. Maybe somebody to come and help him, praise his fingers back, you know, take the sword out of his hand. Hey, there's a lesson for us here, you know. The sword, of course, is the Word of God, isn't it? Never let go of the Word of God. It's lovely to see the kids at the front this morning. I love to see the kids come to church on a Sunday morning here and, and in their own church. And, you know, they come to the front in their own church as well. And somebody speaks to them on a Sunday morning. And then they go to the Sunday school and the Christ the same. Let's keep teaching our children the Word of God. I want to speak to the fathers in church this morning. And I want to speak to the grandfathers in church this morning too. Sometimes, I think I touched on this before when I was here, you know, sometimes fathers and mothers are busy. There's two or three children in the house and they're trying to hold jobs down and everything else. And sometimes, you know, the grandparents, perhaps they're coming to retirement age and have a wee bit more time. 
Do you know what I'm saying, men in the church today? Let's teach our children and our grandchildren the Word of God. What an influence you can have on them, on mothers and grandmothers. When you're putting them to bed at night, let's not be reading them any old tripe. If you let me say that this morning. Let's read them the Word of God, the great stories that are found in the Word of God. Teach up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from him. Perhaps your <clears throat> parents in the meeting this morning, and perhaps your children or teenagers, late teens, because we have been through this, my wife and I, and, and, and you know, well, you know the story. When they go to the grammar schools and the high schools and so on, the, the, the influence other young people have on them, Sometimes they turn away, and there's nobody any different. Don't you think that you're here this morning, and perhaps you have a young one, and perhaps they're, they're, they're out in the world, and perhaps they're wild, and perhaps you don't know what time they're coming home at night, all that sort of stuff. Train up a child in the way she go. So what when they're young, and it's in their mind, and it is in their heart, and maybe when they get a wee bit older, they'll realize, lay the good foundation, like we're saying to the kids this morning, lay the good foundation and it'll never leave them, you know. Eliezer had, the Lord was had his hand. God's working is quick and powerful and sharper than the 22-edged sword. Our time is near gone. Verse 11. <clears throat> and after him was Shema. He was the son of Agi, the Hararite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. And he slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in harvest time on the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Raphidim. Shama, the son of Agi, the Horite. Adino, the Lord of his head, that was tactical. Eliezer, the Lord of his hand, that was practical. But Shama, the Lord of his heart. And that's emotional. The Lord of his heart. Shama sowed this great field of lentils. Now, <clears throat> you wouldn't be in our house too long until you realize I'm not much of a cook. Um, although we can do scramble the egg and stuff. But uh, I asked my wife about these lentils. What do you put lentils in? Well, you can put lentils in soup, I'm told. And uh, you can put them in stew. And uh, I think after that, you have to be really creative for lentils. They wouldn't be much good in the bake off, sure wouldn't. But anyway, Shama had sowed, had sowed this field of lentils. You can see him, he plows the field, and then he sows the seed. And perhaps, then he, perhaps he even sat with it, you know. Perhaps he had sat for a while in the field kept the birds from it, and then the lentils began to sprout. And he had put all the work in. And then the Philistines come. We just had another wee thought about this yesterday, actually. Perhaps you have put your all into work. I don't know anybody's circumstances here this morning, but there's perhaps you have put all your effort into a work. And, and perhaps you've spent a long time on it. Perhaps you've spent years on it. And then perhaps the devil has come, like the Philistines come here. And perhaps he has, has tried to destroy the work. And, and maybe this morning you're asking why things happen. It's so easy in life to ask why. I talked to a guy lately one day, and he said this to me. He says, when you meet somebody in the street and you say, ah, oh, I haven't seen you for a long time, how are you? Oh, dead on. I'm all right. 
And, and this guy says to me, you know, people wear false faces when he's right. And he says, they tell you you're all right, and they tell you you're okay, and then when they go home, close the door, perhaps there's circumstances in their life, perhaps there's circumstances in their family that nobody knows or very few know about. And perhaps they can't talk to anybody about them. Such a delicate problem, perhaps it is. The Lord understands, doesn't he? You know, what would you do without him? What would you do without him in your life? Those of us that are saved this morning. Perhaps you have a circumstance or circumstances in your life this morning, and perhaps it's really difficult. Something to do with your family, something to do with your health, something to do in the home. And, and perhaps there's very few that you can talk to about it. You can talk to the Lord, can't you? How great are thy thoughts unto me, O oh God? He knows about them. He thinks about you. Here's Shama, and he'll put the, the, the work into the ground of lentils, and then these guys, these Philistines come, and, and they're going to, to destroy the field. Perhaps they're going to set it alight. They had it in their heart to destroy this field of lentils on the particular work that Shama had done. But verse 12 tells us he stood in the midst and he defended it and he slew the Philistines and looking again time after time and the Lord wrought a great victory. These were the Lord's men. These guys that come to claim the harvest. But Shema stood. He defended the harvest. He had done the sowing. He had done the reaping. But God had given the increase. And that's the way it is sometimes. Sometimes you sow. And then God gives somebody else the harvest, the reaping. Men have stood in platforms for years and have preached their hearts out 25 and 30 years. And they've seen very little done. And then somebody else comes to the same place and, and begins and, and God brings the harvest. But then that's not our work. You know, you know what our work is? Our work is sow the seed. That's it. Sow the seed. And if we sow the seed, God will bring the harvest. Now, I mean, not in our lifetime. That's up to God. We sow the seed. We're faithful. Comes back to the same thing every time, doesn't it? My old grandmother used to say, Count, she says, here's what God says. Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good preacher, well done, good teacher, and so on. It's well done, good and faithful servant. It's faithfulness that counts. As we finish this morning, we need mighty men and women in the kingdom of God. We need heroes of faith and champions of the gospel. We need faithful people in the church of God. We need men and women who will storm the gates of hell in prayer with the word of God, just like these men in our head, in our hands, and in our hearts. Something very interesting here. There was 300 men in the cave of Adullam. If you read First Samuel 22, they'll tell you that there was 300 men, or sorry, 400 men in the cave of Adullam. 33 of those men are mentioned in this chapter. That's 12%. These 12 percent, these 37 men stood out in the great life of David and in the kingdom of God at this particular time. Some of them, 12 percent of them, came out, came out of the cave and they were just they were willing to take the step. And there's no age difference in the church of God. And if you're in a meeting this morning, I wonder would you leave just with this, this thing in your heart this morning that I'm just going to take another step. For God today. We need people like these men to overcome the enemy. We need people who are not intimidated by numbers like Adino. We need men and women who never let go of the sword like Eliezer. And we need people to defend our cause like Shama. And I wonder, is that you this morning? Are you ready to take a step? Are you ready to go to the next level? 
Are you ready to give your all for God? David's mighty men. David's last words. May God bless his word.